No, I totally get where you're coming from. Um, it's been crazy. So good morning. Good morning. Good morning. We are uh, all we're live probably, on Facebook. Nice. Well, we're probably going to get a, a few more people coming on uh, in the next couple of minutes. But since it's nine o'clock, I am going to go ahead and get started here. So we are going to, oh, hey, uh, Oh, George, you want to go I ahead and make me a co-host? Hang on, hang on. <laughs> Thank you very much. There, button is pressed. Excellent. Yay. All righty. Can we see what's going on here? Yes. See my screen? Excellent. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to the RTP chapter of One Million Cups. Glad you can make it out this week. Excited about our presenter. I've been uh, just met Stephen this morning, but we've been uh, having visits from uh, one of his partners, uh, William, over the last several weeks. And I'm excited to hear about uh, this company and Cameo, uh, and we'll find out more in just a moment. But before that, I'm going to share uh, for those of you who uh, may not know a little bit about One Million Cups. So One Million Cups is a free national program that's designed to educate, engage, and connect entrepreneurs. Uh, we are the local ecosystem building uh, arm of the Kauffman Foundation, Kauffman Foundation being a $4 billion endowment for the promotion of economic development through entrepreneurship. And there are over 160 uh, RT, uh, um, 1 million cups chapters across the country. We're supportive, neutral and industry agnostic space. And this is a non pitch environment, meaning that uh, our presenters are not trying to sell to the room or get investment directly from the room. Uh, what they do come here for is with the idea that there's an ask of the community and we ask a question as a community, which is what can we as a community do to help you, uh, the presenter and entrepreneur. So the format is this, there's one to two startup, com uh, startup companies will give six minute presentations followed by 20 minutes of Q&A from the audience. And as opposed to an open Q&A in this virtual format, we've gone to uh, breakout rooms uh, that are topic specific where we get an opportunity to uh, address the specific asks of the presenter. Uh, once we get past those specific asks, then we go to a more uh, open format. And then we close the meeting with talk around uh, the coffee pot where you get a much more free interaction with presenter and with each other. We would love for people to get involved uh, with One Million Cups. And there's several ways that you can do that. The first is you can become an organizer, which means that you get to help uh, connect and build our startup community by becoming a member of the organizing team. If you're interested in becoming a member of the organizing team, and I've had uh, several people reach out to me recently about that, you can get in contact with uh, me or George, uh, Terry or Tracy, any of the organizers who are on the call today and we'll make sure to get you information and uh, start having conversations with you about how to do that. The second thing you can do is apply to present. So if you have a company that would benefit from presenting in our chapter of One Million Cups, please submit your application at www.1millioncups.com forward slash RTP. Also, if you know somebody who's an entrepreneur with a startup, please refer them to us. Uh, we would love to have them come to a meeting or two, find out what we're all about and, and see if they would benefit from making a presentation at One Million Cups. Let them know we're here and we can help. Uh, and then last but not least, uh, attend and provide excellent feedback to our presenters because that's why our presenters are here because of you, our community, who uh, have a mix of backgrounds, experiences, and always come through with great questions and great observations about our presenters. I want to thank our community organizers. So we've got Tracy Ames, uh, Rosalinda Cruz, myself, our coaches, Terry Conlon and George Stewart, 
Dan Hepworth on video and Krista Johnson Sotomayor, who is our past lead organizer, as well as a wonderful ambassador. And I'm sure uh, most of you out in the community have met and gotten to have conversations with Krista in the past. She's awesome. I'd like to also thank our community sponsors. We've got Muddy Dog Roasting Company, Global Training Initiative at NC State, NC Idea and American Underground, the Imperative Product Operations, the Massapequa Tutor, Soto IP, and New York Life. So as I mentioned before, today's presenter, we've got Stephen Kranovic. Let me try that again, Kranovic. There you go. <laughs> he, is, he is the CEO of NCAMEO, and he's going to tell us about uh, his system for, I think it's developing applications. So. Stephen, I'm going to shut down my screen share and you are up, sir. All right. Thank you. Let me get screen share going here. Uh, and uh, appreciate the uh, One Million Caps community giving us this opportunity to present our company. And let me know if you can see this. Before you do that, um, Stephen, I'm just going to jump in and mention that um, a lot of you know Will Wong, who's been to many, many of our meetings, and uh, Will's the one who brought um, NCAMEO to One Million Cups RTP, and actually um, he works with NCAMEO. Yeah, Will unfortunately had a conflict today, so I was asked to step in, so. Got to take care of customers first sometimes, you know. All right, are we ready to get going? And All right, you are. So all right, uh, so uh, in Cameo, uh, basically our challenge questions for today is, you know, how do we get the attention of those uh, key decision makers, the CIO, CTO, and that want to modernize their current applications, business applications? And then, you know, what are some ways to target some customers for some quick wins uh, across app development? So we'll just lead with those questions so you can think about that during the presentation. All right, so what do we have here? The problem, and I apologize, I'm gonna have to move some things out of the way here real quick. Um, so what are we seeing? Uh, whenever you're sourcing business applications, it takes typically a lot of time, resources, and if you want quality apps, it's gonna drive the cost higher. We see a lot of these entrepreneurs, small businesses, and nonprofits, they get priced out of the market because of the cost of coders and vendors, and there's a pretty much a big demand on that side too. And then when you look at off the shelf solutions, even though you know, it's supposed to be an out of the box solution, it typically requires significant time, resources and costs to adapt those into your specific business operations. So what's the solution? So we came up with InCameo, our no code continuous application modernization enterprise or on cloud uh, platform. Um, it's a no code platform that produces enterprise grade and quality results at a fraction of the time and cost of traditional IT methods. So we're actually are building web and mobile uh, cloud agnostic applications so they can be on any infrastructure service provider. So this is the considered part of the no code, low code marketplace. Uh, when you look at that, um, it's actually going to be 65% of all application development activity by 2024. In 2019, this was a $10.3 billion market. Uh, when you look at the growth rate for the next decade, it's going to be 31.1% year over year. And then uh, TechCrunch even came in and said that the companies in this sector are anticipating raising 500 million in funds in 2020 alone. <clears throat> so when you look at the uh, time cost quality paradigm, typically you can only have one or two of those at the cost of the other. With Cameo, we actually have found that you can get all three. So you can get these enterprise grade and quality applications built in much less time at a significant cost savings. So we basically accelerate the digital transformation of your business operations. How do we do that? So we've got a platform as a service offering. It leverages a no code editor. That's a what you see is what you get to create these best in class web and mobile applications. How do we do that? So we have a number of different components already. Things like layout, controls, data controls, advanced visualization. We have micro apps. So these are basically smaller apps that we've already built for other customers in the past. And you can leverage those so that you don't have to recreate all the different parts and pieces and fields and layouts. You can just take those and then customize them for your unique solution. 
We also have a number of different templates. So these are commonly used forms. Think of, you know, you have individuals, users, um, then you also have companies and accounts. So those are organizations. So because we've already created a number of these different forms, uh, you can basically drag and drop those into your current application development. So then we came uh, about a two year journey, uh, started out in 2017 and we've continued to move all the way. We're actually going to be targeting series A at the beginning of this year. So what's unique about us, we have a metadata driven design. So you don't have to actually rewrite the code when you're basically taking, converting it either a mobile app to web or a web app to mobile. So you're only about 25% of the effort. Um, enterprise level security. So you get all the ADID, multi-factor authentication, Got a number of different integrations uh, across NoSQL, various databases. We leverage APIs, and then we can actually create EDIs. This was born and built on the cloud, so it's native to the cloud. Um, we can embed this within your cloud containers. And obviously it's data lake ready, um, so then you can basically leverage that for all your transaction data store. Our big differentiator is this ability to modernize applications. So we can do a full modernization <clears throat> leveraging native cloud pass and Swagger APIs, or we could actually do a partial modernization. So much like you embed a YouTube video, you can take our code and embed it in there. So what's the benefit of all this? You get 5X uh, productivity increases. You actually save 25% on your cloud infrastructure costs and over 40% in the reduction in, in labor. <clears throat> so we actually have three different models to generate revenue. One is the container. So basically what we're getting is we're getting royalties from Azure, AWS, Google Cloud. Another is a platform as a service model. And this is kind of a pay as you go based on the number of applications and users. And then there's the enterprise license model. And this is for folks that actually wanna build their own applications. So we actually started off thinking we were gonna be more of a SaaS play, but as we've grown and we found a lot of customers want us to build their applications for them and then they can manage them afterwards. So it's become more of a pass offering at this point. So target markets, uh, small business owners, startup entrepreneurs, and, uh, basically any nonprofits who can't afford the expense of coders. On the medium to large businesses, anybody has unmet needs. So automating manual processes, tying in disparate applications and modernizing those legacy applications. Systems data integrators will actually take a license or they'll bring us in as a subcontractor uh, to actually build out major applications for large companies. Uh, we've had a couple of recent successes that Will's done. Um, this is just in, within the last few months. So we actually built a supply chain app in two months and then they had deployed it in three and a half months. And basically this was supposed to have been 12 months of manual coding. Um, so you can see the speed with which we work. We hey, also Steven, do things uh, like- Excuse me, could you uh, wrap up please? Yes, we will do. Uh, we also build blockchain proof of concepts. Uh, we've even done some commercial painting things. We've got our leadership team, um, basically the founder and co-founder, a couple of former military grads, uh, and uh, veterans and those makes up our leadership team and that's the end of my presentation so thank you so again the challenge questions how do we get the attention of cio cto executive decision makers and how do we target customers for some quick wins all right turn it back over to dominic or george sir thank you so much i appreciate it uh so can you um Drop that, yeah. Uh, and I'm going to share just real quick the Q&A format. So um, we're gonna do small breakout rooms and we're gonna, inside the breakout rooms, uh, participate in some open discussion, contribute to questions and ideas. Please remember your room number. And while you're there, uh, please assign a spokesperson <laughs> or agree to a spokesperson for your room to ask the questions that you guys came up with. And then we'll do a, uh, a round robin and uh, virtual coffee chat will come after community announcements. So uh, give George a couple more seconds to put together the breakout rooms and you let us know when you're ready. Yeah, we're ready to go. Um, right. <clears throat> there are going to be five breakout rooms. Um, two of them to ask each question. So uh, room one and one, room three 
will be asked to help with getting decision makers attention. Um, rooms two and four will be asked to help target quick wins. And then we have a fifth room uh, for other ideas that are not part of the ask. So that's the free form room. So we've got five minutes in uh, breakout rooms and then we'll meet back here. And that kicks out the rest of the folks. <laughs> That'll kick out the rest of the folks. So if you're on Facebook um, and you have a question or a suggestion for um, Stephen or for NCAMEO, um, please uh, enter it and we will include the Facebook questions when we get to the round table. And now Stephen's going to entertain us with some uh, either some good jokes or some singing or some card tricks. <laughs> I don't think you want me to sing, that's for sure. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, every time I do that, my wife's like, okay, don't give up your day job. So. <laughs> <laughs> I was, uh, I guess I was in about the third grade and we were singing something in school. Maybe it was second grade. And the teacher at one point said, George, could you not sing so loud, please? And that was the first indication I had that I could not sing. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, you know, being in the military and having to holler all the time, that, that destroyed anything I would have had of a decent voice, that's for sure. So, <laughs> yeah. Oh, I mean, uh, for five minutes, uh, you know, I was uh, actually, I was a combat engineer officer, um, West Point graduate. So like Will, both of us graduated from the military academy. I did not know that, Will. So that yeah. be something I didn't know. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. He's a good guy. I love him. He's been driving a lot of uh, effort and a lot of sales and, and it's been, uh, it's been very enjoyable to have him on the team. So well, it's been great having him here on uh, 1 million cups too. He uh, mm -hmm. often contributes, participates uh, actively. And, yep. uh, and I think it's really helpful to uh, some other company founders. Yeah. He's got a strong background. Um, you know, he did a lot of work in HR for a number of years and, and just has built uh, some great contacts along the way. So, oh Good. yeah. So it looks like our, um, our breakout rooms are about halfway through, <laughs> halfway through their allocated time and they'll come back automatically. Oh yeah. It's funny how attendance dropped off as soon as we went to breakout rooms. Oh, really? People yeah, do. It's just funny. <laughs> you mean I got to talk? Uh, <laughs> how yeah. long have you been doing the new format? Um, I guess this is the fourth or fifth time that we've uh, gone to breakout rooms. Okay. Uh, we tried it the first couple of times and we had some technical issues. In other words, my yep. execution wasn't really good. Um, and I think people were a little bit shy and reluctant and confused, but um, we did a couple of surveys and the first survey said, let's try this a few more times. And then the second survey came back pretty overwhelmingly that this does work. Yeah. Yeah. We got to do that. I think with uh, Sacramento, it worked pretty well. So. So did you go to a breakout session in Sacramento? I did. I did. Ah, so, okay. uh-huh. But I wasn't, I wasn't the presenter. So that's why. So ah. I was one of the attendees. So I basically just kind of, put my ear out there and listened in a bit, so. Yeah, we had one one company present, and I've forgotten who it was fairly early on, and uh, the founder or the presenter went to, um, to a breakout room, and he came back saying, they kicked me out. Whoo, <laughs> <laughs> uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> that wasn't a very, uh, hmm. Well, I think I, I think the the issue was they were trying to come up with questions to ask him, but he was right there, and it just felt everybody felt a little bit awkward. Yeah. So as soon as they would think of the question, he'd try to answer it. Yeah, I think that was sort of what mm -hmm. would happen, or else they would sort of naturally direct the questions toward him. Yeah, th these have been very beneficial for our team. Um, oh, it's good. really kind of helped us around with some of the things we want to take for direction uh, starting twenty twenty one. And so, you know, we know that we are not strong in marketing. So that's definitely an area that we've got plans for and, uh, you know, spend uh, that we've got in, you know, 
targeted for 2021. That's good. Um, I should compliment you before everybody comes back and say that um, you really tightened up your presentation. I, I like I like the changes you made. Oh, thanks. Thanks. So, well, uh, and I think, you know, Mike is not quite as fluent on presenting just yet. And that was uh, one of his early struggles. He hadn't really done a lot of that deck yet. So. All right. So let's close the breakout rooms. There you go. <clears throat> They've had their time. I think they get a 15 second uh, notification. All right, I think everybody is back. Welcome back and I hope uh, you came up with some good suggestions and uh, some probing questions. So we're gonna start first with um, group one to get decision makers attention. So that was the group with uh, Terry and Brett and Elizabeth. Good morning. So we, um, Terry had some really great ideas <laughs> and then we, we went from there. Um, he was saying, you know, utilize your network. What, what connections do you already have in place and how can you leverage those existing connections? Um, and then we weren't sure what methods and avenues had already been utilized and worked, what had already been tried mm -hmm. and did not work so well. But um, Triangle Business Journal has an annual list. It's called the Book of Lists. And we weren't sure if you had already started using that, if it was on your radar. And once you have that information, sometimes it just takes cold calling. Yep. Okay, thanks. Appreciate that. So I did not know about the book of list. Um, I think Will may be familiar with that. So that'll be definitely one of his tasks to take over. Good. Hey, thanks, Elizabeth. Uh, next one is uh, targeting quick wins. This is with uh, Cindy, Joe, and Tracy. Yeah, we were um, we were just talking about um, how you can maybe define a, a smaller target market for the next few months to try to get you know some case studies, try to get some customer penetration in terms of a specific target. We don't know if you have you know sub segments of your target, and so trying to figure out what would be the next you know most relevant target within your much larger target of small businesses. Yeah, we, we do have a plan to go after some logistics company based on the success we have with this recent app development. Um, but there are definitely a couple other areas um, that, and I guess we're hoping maybe the community here might say, hey, here's, here's an industry that could really use that or a smaller market. One of the things I wanted to add to that on top of building your case studies, build out personas of who exactly you want your clients to look like. Um, your, your target audience was, like she said, is just too big. We need to, you need to niche that down to start. If you can build up personas, that'll really help you target this, who you're looking for. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I think it'll also help you. Um, I think that's a great point that, and it would be great to help you define what's value for those customers, right? Each, each, um, segment is going to have a different value proposition. So it'll help you define how your you know, your application would help them each individually versus on a broader scale? Yeah, we, we've really struggled with that um, because you can, there are so many different business applications out there that we can create with our no code development platform. So trying to get those early wins uh, to, you know, narrow that down in that focus has been really hard for us. All right, thanks group two. Let's go to group three. So we're back to getting the attention of decision makers. So this is the group with Jenny, Joe, Josh, Phil, and Ted. All right, well, we bypassed the spokesperson, so I'll just start talking. Um, <laughs> um, one of the things was that, uh, that we mainly focused on was looking, I looked at your website, um, and so we started a conversation with that. Um, I think that, uh, and we talked about using video content as a way to create evangelical lower workers right because it's not you want to get to the decision makers but you can't get there without um going up the steps right and finding mm -hmm. people who you know finding the the cloud architects and the um it coders and things like that so 
um, and and those fra maybe it's a fractional IT department, maybe it's the fractional marketing officer. Mm -hmm. um, but you find those people and you can do that through really strong video content. So it's great that you have all those companies on the homepage saying like, these are all the people we've worked with, but it's more impactful and more powerful if you create video content and right. have them create video testimonials where you can plug in the data where they're talking about, this is how much money we saved. This is how much time we saved. This is how it, you know, it multiplied our productivity, all of those things um, because video is where it's at. And then you can actually, um, create a YouTube channel that's embedded into your site, all of those, you know, talk about all the things that your product can do. And that helps your SEO because when I typed in and cameo, nothing came up. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's important. Too. Yep. Thank you. Appreciate that. So. All right. So another group on targeting quick wins. Uh, so this is Michael Ray Tassos and Tony. Hi, this is Mike. Um, I don't know how I got uh, nominated to, to, to talk because clearly the other three guys on the call were way more experienced in this space. So I'm just going to lay out an outline and let the other guys come off mute and, and fill in the details. But I think the first thing that, that we, we kind of felt was strong was really look at, um, again, kind of back to the other groups, uh, what is your target audience? And maybe really consider that target audience being more like the grassroots folks, the smaller folks that are really going to use the app. Um, you talked about possibly targeting the, you know, the higher, higher end of, of companies. Think about going the other, other direction. Think about going to the folks that are actually going to use it, the folks that are going to get stuck with it, and the ones that are really going to support it in, in, from that perspective. Because what that's going to also help you do is not only are you going to enter with those folks maybe a little easier, you're going to access them a little easier. Um, it's also going to generate the flywheel effect, um, you know, going into that, that kind of small SMB type space. Um, and then uh, just another comment was to kind of help with some adoption is, you know, really bring some numbers behind what are the benefits to, to the application. Um, you know, what does it do in terms of UX examples? What does it mean to the user? Um, and, and any kind of specific case results, um, you know, examples would, would be helpful. Okay. Hey, Michael, uh, something else that I said, uh, I just thought about right now. Um, so, um, a lot of uh, most of the SMB business, which should be your target, are working with channels. So uh, being able to actually get into um, the, you know, the channel and being able to, uh, you know, in introduce the solution to channel, uh, it will actually help a lot the scalability and being able to actually reach uh, a lot of multiple customers because SMBs are pretty difficult to actually reach. So channel is, uh, you know, where you need to actually uh, go and look after. Yeah, that's a good point. Channels and, and referral partners would be really mm -hmm. key, building up the partner network. Okay, thanks. So, yeah, we have uh, definitely some marketing budget set aside for the next three months to really focus in on that. Stephen, I think the reason why we were touching on that SMB part uh, versus like going bigger than that was, was from the standpoint of risk. Mm -hmm. um, so many of the larger companies are going to go for something that's safer and has, uh, it's more proven. And uh, so that one kind of is why we, we think that SMB is something for you to, to do. Um, identifying, I put it on the chat there, just getting narrow and deep in your focus. I mean, that goes to just about any <laughs> startup, right? It's oh, yeah. what's that right thing to dial in on. Um, sometimes early, you know, we wanna be all things to everyone. And, and while your platform or your offering may offer that, just, uh, just being mindful that there's a niche that will need it. Um, identify who those users are going to what Michael said. Um, we'll present you with that flywheel to get to the actual companies that it makes sense for. At least that's that's kind of what we we had a consensus of. Yep. What one other proven successful? Hey, hey guys, I'm I'm gonna um, tell Tony if you can hold that. We're gonna go around and then we'll come back to your group just to make sure everybody gets a chance. So we're gonna go to group five. Uh, that's Dominic, Frank, Mark, and Ricardo. Um, what do you guys come up with? Yeah, so the group appointed, or Dominic appointed me after the end of our session. So um, but we were looking at other ideas around um, how to, to, to sell and market this. And one of the things, I'm actually um, active in the, the NCLC community. Uh, a guy who worked at Zapier um, created yep. one via Slack. And I think there's a huge opportunity for you guys to get involved there because um, there are a lot of people in that space who, who can become advocates. But the second part is uh, for fractional CIOs and CTOs at smaller companies, their resource and time constraint. 
So they may not look to do high end or very or custom development, but a solution that gets them 80% of the way there quickly and affordably would probably be really appealing to them. The second part of that is this is a, a movement. And so it's a it's an industry transition. So if you're cultivating that industry transition, it's be really effective because getting heard in the content uh, eco ecosystem today or getting a cold call through today is going to be a challenge, particularly as we face you know, the, the economic and social conditions. So guys, did you want to add anything to that? Well, I was going to say one of the, the primary observations is that uh, this solution seems to be more directed towards smaller and startup companies who uh, likely don't have a CTO or CIO. So uh, it's problematic to even try to be targeting those folks. Uh, I think um, it, I, I just heard somebody talk uh, about channel partners, uh, those channel partners would be the ones uh, uh, that I would be targeting, such as the fractional uh, CTOs, the um, IT companies who serve as an outsourced uh, information technology service for those smaller companies. Uh, you, could, you could come in as that application development partner for those companies, and then it becomes you know, a steady stream of customers coming to you as opposed to you, know, you going out and having to find each individual client. Thanks, appreciate that. So it's good information to have. Good, thank you. So we're gonna uh, circle back around and go through, uh, go through all the groups one more time. So we'll go circle back to uh, group one, which is Brett, Elizabeth, and Terry. Um, anything to add, guys? Mm, I think we pretty much covered it on the first go round. All right, thanks, Brett. Um, so targeting quick wins, Cindy and Joe. Group two. <laughs> I think that's pretty much all that we had. So all just right, just we're getting through this one really quickly. Um, getting the attention of decision makers. This is group three: Jenny, Joe, Josh, Phil, and Ted. I, I um, I'll break the mold here. I just wanted to elaborate on something that I think we said in our group, and also I heard someone else said that I, I um, I think is a valuable point. Um, and to your, your question about getting the attention of the CIO. Um, I think that's the wrong question, the wrong ask, um, because your your pathway, uh, you, you you need someone to lead you to that CIO. And um, so one of the things I think we got cut off in our group was this idea of um, creating kind of a kit, almost like a media kit that you can give to sort of the, the worker bee uh, that right. shows the, the value proposition of your company. Um, and I, I have some experience working within IT organizations, but basically you know, you've got the decision maker, the guy with the purse strings, and by and far, they're probably not a technical person. They don't understand technology. Um, and so they're relying on all the people behind them to come up with all these solutions. So you coming into the organization, talking to the CIO, um, is only going to happen after you've, you've got, gotten the trust and credibility of the person that's probably going to be implementing that, that, that situation. And then that kind of dovetails into all this sort of stuff about how do you market in the video and all the other the other things that our, our, our group is talking about, but um, perhaps just reconfigure a question. Don't go after the CIO, you know, go, go after the, uh, go after the guy with that's actually going to be doing that, that uh, work with your software. So that's, I just right. wanted to add that. Thanks, Josh. I, could throw, I might throw something in here, George. Uh, and, and I like the ideas that the different people brought up as far as hitting the people that are actually going to be doing the work and working their way up. That takes a little longer, but it can be effective. I also uh, think that the points that Dominic made about many of these small companies don't have a full-time CIO or CTO is valid. One of the ways I think to reach those upper level people, and I like the idea of uh, getting into the, uh, the fractional uh, CIO or CTO type people that are doing consulting work and then getting your way in, your foot in the door that way. You can reach some of these people by some finding out where they, those types of people hang out. Do they hang out in like the IT networking groups like maybe T-Tech or something else? Um, and, and if you can get an introduction to one of those people directly from somebody that you know, doing that search maybe through LinkedIn or whatever, or, or just people that you run into, that can get you right in the door and not have to work your way up that food chain to the top person. 
Uh, great information. Thanks, Ted. All right. So, Tony in Group 4, I know I cut you off, and I apologize for that, but uh, the floor is yours. No problem at all. S same, similar idea to, to others, which is, you know, going after this, the, the higher up executives is, is a, a tall ask. Your target audience really is the, because low code, no code is not simple. It doesn't mean you don't have to have any technical background. It's, it's complicated, no matter how you die. I mean, it's easier than coding an app, you know, from raw, raw code, right. but it's still not something that your average, you know, person at a company is going to want to say, you know what, let me automate this and let me go use low code. It's going to be somebody who's motivated, who's kind of, you know, wants to take the ball and just run with it. And they have some ability to, you know, really understand the problem they're trying to solve. How can you make it as easy as possible for that person at small and large companies to use your system? I think Airtable is a really good um, kind of example to follow. What did they do? They put as much money into onboarding and automating that onboarding process, make it as simple as possible for that secretary who needs to do COVID-19 tracking that doesn't have a budget for a developer, but needs to develop a low code thing. How, can she go to your website right now, or him or her? And you know, is there a free tier she can use? And is it polished enough to where she can create something simple like that? Maybe even give her a template to do it. And that will, will get more people in the door. And then as, as she gains traction and becomes popular at her company, other people start looking at her and then kind of things just snowball from there. That's kind of what I've seen in, in our experience, especially large companies that have IT departments. They look at low code, no code, and they say, right. well, we're going to be stuck with the bag maintaining it later. You know, okay, can I eject the application? What does the code look like when you eject it and so forth? So there's an uphill, more of an uphill battle there, and they're going to be a little bit more they're going to just want more things, be a little bit higher maintenance than the person who wants to do a couple quick wins. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tony. Stephen, I'd, I'd like to throw throw a thought out there. I um, I was thinking about this while we were just chatting and I was like, you know, in thinking of channel partners, early stage startup founders at the idea stage, you know, they're going to be the forward thinking, willing to sit down, make something work. But, you know, the idea that one has to, you know, create an MVP and get some proof points. It seems like they may be a channel through like incubators and things, not accelerators per se, but incubators where they're gonna help you to get the case, the use cases. Right. For how things can be used and and maybe even show you other opportunity. Do you think there's an opportunity there for you? Oh, most definitely. I mean, we've had some wins already in that space. So we've actually created applications that became companies in and of themselves. So, you know, there were some uh, startups that basically had their ideas. We got their proof of concept, got their MVP, they got their funding, and they actually launched the company based off the application we built for them. So they're on your stack? Yes. That's great. That, that so, sounds just like... It's, it's not as many as we want, but obviously, so... <laughs> cool. Cool. Thank you. Yeah. Great idea, though. So... Steve, what is All your right. current bell structure? Sorry, <clears throat> sorry, can I just ask one question real quick, George? What is sure. your current bell structure, Steve? You, Our sales you? structure. Mm -hmm. So right now what we've got, we've got uh, some uh, commission sales folks that basically are going out there. Uh, we had worked through an accelerator that's uh, a bunch of academy grads that have provided uh, some funding into the company and leveraging their network contacts. So that's what we've been trying to do over the last few months. Um, our next uh, push that we're going into in 2021 is pretty heavy on the marketing side. Uh, we're actually going to leverage some outside sources that are going to help us with, you know, pushing all the SEO, uh, the LinkedIn campaigns uh, and those types of things. So we've got, you know, plan for the next three months to leverage those and see what we can get from a traction perspective. So that's where we're at at the moment. So. Hey, thanks, Michael. Um, we have one more group. Um, so this will wrap things up. Uh, group five, the other ideas, Dominic, Frank, Mark, Ricardo. Last kick at the can, guys. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think. Uh, well, I was going to say I know Rick had a couple of other points, but Frank, you want to go yeah. ahead first? Yeah, I, I wanted to say just a, a couple of other things. One is to steal an idea from Ray Antonio, although I'm not sure why he uh, didn't mention it. Uh, Sell more faster um, is a great read specifically about this that was written by a Tech Stars uh, alum and actually one that a guy who ran the accelerator that Ray went through. So highly uh, recommend that book. Um, the second thing is, and, and I'm, a, I'm a marketer, I write a column for Grepbeat, 
um, I had a chance to interview the, v the CMO at Pendo, and he talked about the importance of their, uh, of their, of their freemium model. While they were you know, poo-pooed a while ago, it's made a great comeback because you get people onto the platform and they get to play around with it and understand all the power of it. And I think it was Tony's point about Airtable, you know, they did a great job of that. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we've talked about a lot of different moving pieces, but before you scale with marketing, and I'm a marketer, so I'm going to say this, before you scale with marketing, understanding who you're marketing to and having this process of sell more faster in place so that you do not spin your wheels and that you don't leave a misperception or a poor perception with audiences that you could later target is a really important thing to think through at this stage of a company. Yeah, great information. Thanks, Frank. And as you can see, Ray is, um, I think he has an ambassador deal with him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there it is. All right, Rick, hey. you uh, want to go ahead with the? Yeah, I think I'm going to save them for the uh, for the private chat because okay. they may take too long. Yeah, sure. Great. Hey, thanks, guys. Uh, that's it for the Q and A. Um, Dominic's going to wrap us up with community announcements and whatever else he does. Sure thing. Uh, so as George mentioned in the chat just a moment ago, uh, we're going to do the community announcements. Uh, format is simple. If you have uh, an event or something about your company you'd like to share, uh, a new community resource or something that we haven't talked about in a while that you'd like to remind the community of, please uh, let George know. He'll put you in the queue for community announcement. And as many of you know, if you don't get in the queue, I will call on you because I know who you are and what you do. So <laughs> I'm going to start with a quick community announcement. Um, it's the holiday season. And uh, as we're all keenly aware of in 2020, uh, COVID-19 has... Um, created uh, some very unique situations and a lot of problems for uh, people in our community, particularly people that have lost jobs, homes, uh, and there's a, a massive amount of food insecurity. Uh, the um, food bank of uh, Central and Eastern North Carolina uh, in the first four months of the COVID crisis spent twice their annual budget on food in those four months alone. And they really need help, particularly in this holiday season. Uh, so um, I've got a current GoFundMe campaign uh, going on to raise money for the food bank and every little bit helps. A dollar buys five meals. Uh, I'm going to put the link to that campaign into the chat, but if you could please uh, help people in your community because, you know, it's the right thing to do and giving comes back around to all of us. So, uh, you know, please help. George, we got somebody next. Um, Brett has an announcement. No prize for guessing what it is. <laughs> hey, Brett, we can't hear you. Oh, I thought George was muted. I, I didn't hear. All right. Anyway, hi, it's Brett Chambers, and we're still, I'm still doing the Brett's open mic at the Blue Note Grill. Uh, tonight, every Wednesday from 7 to 9, we used to be 8 to 11, but we moved it up. Um, and I'm really concerned with the COVID cases going up because that may impact us, but we go from 7 to 9, so you have time to get home by 10. And the people wear masks. Um, they follow all the guidelines, temperature checks, all that stuff. So, um, but the music's good, and it's become more like a, a people... Uh, looking at it as their mental health break in the middle of the week because they get to go out and be amongst people but or be around people but be there safely so it's one of the few things that we have left so i'm trying to hold on to it and everybody respects the fact that we're trying to keep it safe so please join us thank you thanks brad and uh, frank's got two announcements Woohoo! i'm making up for lost time so first <laughs> announcement um if you guys uh follow Brett Beat, uh, Home Lending Pal. I'm the CMO for the company. 
we were one of the top two teams in the Village Capital Accelerator of Finance Forward 2020. It's sponsored by MetLife and PayPal. And so we'll receive a grant from the MetLife Foundation. But for those of you who've been uh, a member of one or an attendee of One Million Cups for a while, we pitched at One Million Cups back last year when Jim Roberts um, was helping to organize. So just want to give you guys an update on the company. I want an alum uh, company. And then the second is I'm on the board of Kids Notes, K-I-D-Z-N-O-T-E-S. We provide music lessons to uh, kids between kindergarten and sixth grade. Um, since schools have basically been shut down, we've gone to a virtual model. So if you are a supporter of the arts and education, you know, we can always, uh, we always appreciate a donation at the end of the year. Again, it's K-I-D-Z-N-O-T-E-S. Thanks, Frank. And uh, that's it. Unless Dominic, you have something else. Uh, yeah, of course. Um... As, as you know, we've, uh, we've recently had a couple of organizers that had to uh, step away from their organizing duties. So we are uh, always looking for more people in our community to step up and help make uh, these meetings of, of the RTT chapter of One Million Cups possible. And uh, I will reiterate our weekly ask is we want you to get involved and we also are always looking for presenters. Uh, you know, this, this is a, a voluntary organization. This is a community service that we do, but you know, we have, as um, uh, Tracy likes to say, we're surrounded by pipelines and this is another uh, pipeline type organization. We have to have uh, presenters who are going through the process of intake coaching, building their presentations, and then being slotted to present here. If we don't have presenters, we don't have meetings. So if you know anybody out there who has a startup, uh, if you've presented here in the past, I'm looking at you, Frank, or you intend to present here in the future, you work with companies that are in their first five years, uh, and they could benefit from being a presenter at One Million Cups, please tell them we're here invite them to a meeting. We would love to be able to help them and we would love to see if, the, if presenting for our group would benefit them. So let people know about us. Thank you. And with that, I think we're at a wrap. Uh, George, if you pull us off of Facebook,